To get the entire episode and all our content, look for a podcast of Biblical Proportions on all podcasting platforms. Hello everybody and welcome to a podcast of Biblical Proportions, episode 12, The Biblical Male Gaze. So this is a bonus episode on top of the regular episodes following the Biblical narrative. Uh, We might do this once in a while. Hope you enjoy it. The male gaze is a term from uh, film studies. It describes the way that viewers engage with the visual media. Uh, because most of the visual media is made by males, specifically one kind of male, the way it portrays women is from their point of view. And if you look at visual media, you can actually analyze it by the way that uh, shots and reaction shots, mm-hmm. the way that there's a slow motion on a woman's body, in let's say Bond films, the point of view is not only by a male creator who created that story and the visual media, but also by the viewers themselves, some of them are women, of course, that they ascribe to that point of view. And we're going to use that way of thinking and apply it to the biblical story. The biblical story is not visual media. So the exact term male gaze, which describes a gaze, i.e. viewing something does not necessarily apply here but we will use it as a way to look at the point of view of the people who wrote the bible and figure out what kind of male wrote the bible and what his perspective on his on the surrounding societies and yes. uh, and cultures yes because all of the stories all of these ancient stories have the male gaze yeah but it's a different kind of male gaze when you look at the Greek stories, Sumerian stories, so that will be interesting. And we can apply the Bechtel test mm-hmm. to the Bible. So the Bechtel test, you have to have to pass the test. You have to have two female ca- named female characters that talk to each other, not about a man. So mm-hmm. of the named characters, only five to eight percent are named female characters mm-hmm. in the Bible. And the, the women who have uh, to have speaking roles only 93 characters in the whole bible yeah female have characters spe- have speaking yeah. roles and only 49 of them quote unquote speaking names. roles yes <laughs> dialogue dialogue yes they have lines lines the rest are extras yeah unless they do something incredible out of the ordinary and then you name them extras or if we use a philosophical term object in uh, in a sense that they are not subjects okay so Let's get into the kind of uh, males that uh, would write these stories. As we said, it's quite obvious that most myths were written by males, by men. And they lived in a patriarchal society. Yeah, obviously. obviously. Uh, No need to mention that. (laughs) When we talk about patriarchal societies, uh, we are used to myths that, of course, come from the male perspective and adhere to certain male values, such as courage, uh, aggressiveness, uh, conquering. Also competitive, it's very competitive, the stories. If you look at the Greek mythology, one value is overly promoted there, the value of Ariste, uh, nobleness of spirit. The main protagonist of that uh, Ariste is Odysseus, which is a conniving, uh, it's very smart, but also very aggressive and protective. And, and even there, the women the characters are all uh, <laughs> objects in his own story. On, obstacles, own obstacles sometimes. Yes. sometimes. Or, or goals, you know. The male gaze is, I think, it, even today, is, it's kind of uh, old school, uh, the, the theory itself, because it, it talks a lot about psychoanalysis, and they are fixated with eroticism and sex. Uh, I think the male gaze here is not only... a sex and uh, it's also a promotion of male values that are certain male values yes and we talked about in greek it that that Ariste, but here it's something different okay it's not a heroism yes it's not only even conquering and beating other nations or achieving empire or no. cheating the gods or f- fulfilling your human potential right right being like a super winner and stuff no no it's very outsider's perspective about society it's look at those going no, 
look at those uh, other people and let's do the opposite. And it also has a negative opinion about sex, apparently. <laughs> Uh, about uh, there's no eroticism in uh, in these stories. There's also a rejection of uh, of sculptures and paintings of visual representations of God. So the point of view here, I think, is not the point of view of the soldier or the king or the policymaker slash politician uh, or even the s- demigod that ch- challenges the the gods and in himself. Uh, tells us something about the human potential to be God. Here is a very obedient, maybe borderline OCD character. It's the point of view of the shaman, maybe. The point of view of the priest. He, it's not... His control over society is through uh, rituals, not through conquering. It's through uh, being the relay station to the deity. Yes, that's and his control, yeah. and, and here we can see it's it's the priest perspective. Yes, the priestly perspective. Priestly. That's, easy, that's easier yeah. to say. Priestly, priestly. Yes. So, like the first hero we talked about ab- about him in the last f- uh, couple of episodes, a few episodes ago, uh, Noah. Noah, not an interesting character. No, the, uh, his obedience uh, is a uh, lone character trait that is relevant. In the story, they're obedient uh, to Yahweh. They're not obedient to the king. That's a crucial difference. Like these stories, uh, they are not the kinds of stories that a great king would want uh, necessarily to promote in his kingdom that lives right next door. Because what is he going to do with it? This yeah. is not very useful uh, a lot of for char- powerful people. Yeah, a lot of characters in the Bible are extremely flawed, and their flaws are showing. The King David is an uh, adulterer. Adulterer. And mm. he has a conflict in his story to adult or not to adult. <laughs> so what does one do yeah. with a woman that you want to adult with? <laughs> you uh, kill her husband? Yeah. You get him killed? You, s- you send him away. Send him away to die. Even uh, Moses in the Jewish tradition, he had a, a stammer. Uh-huh. Uh, he's not perfect and he even doesn't get to see the problems right, because he's been punished uh, yeah, or whatever cr- yeah so there's always a downgrade of humans it's not a story that a king will pay for a scholar to write and to glorify him yeah. uh, you tell too much i don't leave that th- that's that part is supposed to be left out <laughs> uh, off with your head bring me bring me another uh, scribe <laughs> So here it's like the kings are already dead <laughs> at the time of the writing of that story or the most of the kings and yes. most of the heroines yes. or most of the heroes are dead. Now Even the kings, you give, you give props to the kings, but there are a lot of stuff in the story that, uh, that, 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 that kings wouldn't want to, yeah. to have uh, for David yeah. and for Solomon and uh, mistakes that they made and what happened right after that they died. Like they w- I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, <laughs> female uh, characters so we have uh, eve that uh, that uh, gets uh, convinced very easily to do something that she wasn't supposed to do to go against uh, yahweh's orders and then with abraham his wife is yeah. very passive yeah. he just gives her to other people yeah, and it's almost a commodity yeah like he, the only thing that she does is uh, laugh uh, when uh, told that she's gonna have a boy, a, a commodity also uh, uh, for Jacob later, the third father. Mm-hmm. He wants to marry one uh, one woman. He has to buy her. Yeah. And then he's given h- her sister. And he's like, damn, OK, so I have to work some more to buy the first one that I wanted. So she's like a trophy, something yeah. that you have to achieve. She doesn't yeah. have any agency of her own. And uh, what do you think about uh, the witch of Endor <laughs> character? The Witch of Endor. <laughs> it's not from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> There's actually, this is, I found this out yesterday. <laughs> There's the Witch of Endor. Uh, Eshed Balat of uh, Endor. The Witch of Endor. That's her, her English it's name. It's a Saul story, no? It's a Saul story yeah. that brings yeah. Samuel back from the dead. And yeah. he takes over her. His spirit, and then she talks. A science. It's a, it, not a science. A science. Science. Uh, or oracle or yeah. something. This is... A, this is th- these are the stories of the Bible. The the best parts of the Bible. You're just yeah. you, you're not told about them. Yeah. This is incredible. Okay, and there's uh, all the whole thing about Lot's uh, wife and yeah. Lot's daughters, not yeah. named. Yeah, 
uh, things happen to them. They do stuff. We're going to talk about it uh, some other time. <laughs> but they either either they don't they don't do as they're told and they get pu- and they get punished for it, or they do very bad b- very bad things to men. Yeah, they force men to have sex. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. There's also Yael, I think, who murdered Sisra, which is a a commander <coughs> in a foreign army in some story. We will reach mm-hmm. to that. We re- when we reach that, we'll uh, explain more. But basically, the female character is quite obvious from a patriarch- patriarchal society and a male perspective. They are treated as either a function, something that is supposed to function in terms of bringing babies to life, or as an object to be traded with. And even the male themselves, <laughs> obviously, they are more complex and they carry the human uh, conflict inside of them yes but they are also very very flawed because we yes. don't want to glorify people too much that's the yes. perspective of the the beta male <laughs> that wrote <laughs> that wrote the, the beta male that wrote the bibles to get the entire episode and all our content look for a podcast of biblical proportions on all podcasting platforms